your typical murder scene or uh, crime of passion. A vicious killer is out there somewhere. This particular crime scene had a ton of overkill. Police chase every lead. We were following up. Everything had come in, and everything that came in produced absolutely nothing. This was a whodunit, and no one likes a whodunit. And when they finally crack this baffling case, they're shocked at what they find. And the whole thing was just preposterous. Grove City, Ohio, a leafy, tranquil suburb outside of Columbus. Grove City is a very friendly neighborhood. People are basically your you know, blue-collar workers. It's not a real large area. You have a small inner city that has your basic mom-and-pop kind of stores, and then it branches out into the, uh, the farms a little bit. Strong values and hardworking people make this an idyllic corner of America. It's a great place to raise a family. Uh, area churches, schools are well known. And there's not much of a crime problem in Grove City. Grove City is a generally very safe neighborhood, very safe town. <laughs> but on a cold January afternoon, one call to police changes everything. 911, what's your emergency? And when this call came in, investigators had no way to know that it would launch an investigation that would tear a family apart, not once, but twice. Police rush to the scene of the crime and find the lifeless bodies of Lois and Charles Cauley. Their 30-year-old son, Robert Cauley, found his parents and called police. What do we have here? Uh, it's two bodies inside, one laying inside the door, one over towards the dining room. OK, thanks. All right. When uh, Robert entered into the uh, kitchen area, he could uh, see his mom laying in the kitchen and dad lying in the dining room area. And to him, he said it was obvious that they were dead and he called 911. There was a lot of blood around the scene. Uh, several knives were around the scene. It did appear that Charles and Lois had been stabbed multiple times. It's a brutal double murder with unusual victims. This was quite different. This was a couple in their 60s. Married for 40 years, Lois and Charles Cauley were pillars of the Grove City community. He was a former Army MP and uh, owned his own plumbing company. She was a church activist, an organist for the local Catholic church. They had three children, five grandchildren. This is not your typical murder scene or uh, crime of passion. As the CSI team begins to process the scene, investigators search the home for clues. The back door, glass was knocked out. Once you get into the dining room, the table's turned over. The place is ransacked. There was one bedroom off to the left that stuff was everywhere. So it looks like we had, we had a fight here in the dining room. Looks like some kind of struggle, multiple stab wounds. And that's when a theory emerges. As you move through the dining room and then you go into the actual living room, you saw items that were stacked in front of the door, which would lead you to believe that possibly this was a burglary that had been interrupted. Did the Collies simply come home at the wrong time? You have Charles and Lois still with their jackets on. You have evidence, or I guess goods, piled up at the front of the door. This could possibly be a burglary that went bad. Police then questioned the Collie's neighbors. And we went up down the street and talked to different people, knocked on their doors, and then went inside and talked with them a little bit if they saw anything on this particular night. Have you ever hearing anything unusual last night or seen anything unusual? Um, no. No, I don't think I did. The Collie murders created quite a stir because Grove City was such a quiet town. And this was a couple in their 60s, found with their coats on, bludgeoned to death, and stabbed. This case brought some panic to the area because they didn't know if it was a rash of burglaries that were, had led to violence. 
This was a whodunit, and no one likes a whodunit. With no time to lose, Detective Scott looks for anything that could lead police to the killer. Detective Scott, can I help you? At that time, we went ahead and looked for other types of burglaries, similar types of situations that maybe occurred in Columbus, Grove City, and other jurisdictions. Do you have any information? I know you've seen a lot of stuff on the, on the news and the you know, media. We did not find anyone that had any burglaries, so that was kind of uh, a lead that uh, grew cold. Detective Scott next turns to the autopsy report. And finally, he gets a clue that could send the case in a new direction. Police could be looking for more than one killer. In Grove City, Ohio, police are investigating the double murder of Charles and Lois Cauley. The killings have residents and police on high alert. There was some fear in the neighborhood that this could happen to them. Pressure is a noise issue, especially when it's a, it's a high-profile murder like the Collies were. Um, and, and you do feel that because people want answers. Looking for those answers, investigators turn to the autopsy report. Charles and Lois Collies' bodies were found on a Sunday afternoon. And from the coroner's report, we believe that they were killed around 11.30 Friday evening. The autopsy revealed that they um, had multiple stab wounds and they had uh, blunt force trauma also to the head. This was a very violent scene. And there's something strange about the way the Collies were murdered. Multiple knives were used. The suspect used, uh, I think, four or five different knives. The suspect bent two of the knives, uh, maybe from hitting uh, the uh, Collies' uh, bodies, possibly bones multiple knives and possibly multiple killers. We did not rule out that there could have been maybe two or three people just due to the fact that um, Mr. Colley was a good sized guy and he was known to be pretty strong and in good shape and he would try to fend these guys off. And the closer police look at this case, the less it looks like a burglary gone bad. Because of the amount of violence that was involved with this, uh, this was a rage. Typically, with a rage, it's somebody that knows the victims uh, and has a personal vendetta against them. This particular crime scene had a ton of overkill. You're stabbing multiple times, and a burglar would probably not do that. They may strike out and attack once, uh, so that way they could get an opportunity to exit and get out of there. If a burglar didn't kill the Collies, then who did, and what was their motive? Police first turn to the victim's family. When you're dealing with uh, this type of crime, where they're dealing with anger and knives, uh, the first people that you have to rule out are the family. We spoke uh, in depth with the family members, Patty, Robert, and Melissa. Anybody over there causing any problems with him? Yeah, they're all usually pretty friendly there. The family members were very shocked about what had occurred. Uh, they were very distraught and upset. All three of the uh, children to the Collies were alibied out. Each one of them uh, had a uh, person saying that they were at different locations at the time of death. We had no reason to believe that the family members were involved in these homicides. Very sorry, sorry for your loss. And we decided to go back and really focus in on the crime scene to see if there's anything we possibly could have missed. You start then looking at the crime scene again through different eyes. You say, I looked at it as a burglary. How about we don't look at it as a burglary? Let's look at it from a different angle now and see if that leads us to a different direction. And that's what we were able to look more closely at the back door. There was a lot of glass on the outside. Glass on the outside could mean that the window was broken from the inside. Now, another part of the crime scene, which was very confusing, the back door was broken out. But the suspects in this particular burglary took all the evidence that they wanted and took it to the front door. Why would you do that? The evidence that was selected and piled up at the front of the door looked like something that a child would select. They were items like a BB gun, an answer machine, a phone. These would not be what you would say is uh, items that were generally taken out of a burglary. Typical items that burglars like to take are like your TVs, your VCRs, 
any type of cash. They also like to take guns. It's something that's pawnable that they can get out and, and get money for quickly. After looking at the crime scene further, we believe that this is probably, in our opinion, looking more like a staged crime scene than anything else. The number one reason that someone would stage a crime scene is obviously because they knew the victims and obviously to throw off the cops' investigation. With a new focus, Detective Scott scrutinizes everyone in the Collie's life, looking for anyone with a motive. We felt it was somebody that knew the family, uh, so we were in the process of el eliminating, uh, first of all, employees, and second of all, um, close associates, um, anybody that had a ven vendetta against the family for whatever reason. We were looking at, uh, again, family members, business associates, trying to find something that we had missed before. We called all the business people, tried to find out any type of bad dealings they had, any rumors. But there's no one with a motive for murder. We could not find anyone that wanted to harm Charles and Lois Colley. They were extremely loved by their community, and they were actually pillars of their community. With the case still making headlines, police asked the people of Grove City for help. Due to the fact that Charles and Lois were so liked, we had a lot of people uh, offering money for rewards, uh, and the news media was also very much involved. And in this small town, rumors run rampant. Police are flooded with tips, and one of those tips stands out. We uh, received one call uh, in reference to a woman at a restaurant who was very distraught, seemed disoriented, uh, confused, was looking around as if she was extremely scared. It all happened the night Lois and Charles Cawley were murdered. And the restaurant is just a few miles from the crime scene. We didn't know if she was uh, maybe involved in some way, um, but we definitely need to find out if she was. Could this mystery woman help police catch a killer? Charles and Lois Cawley have been found stabbed to death in their Grove City, Ohio home. Investigators turned to the community for tips that could lead them to the killer. We encouraged any type of information, any unusual situations that may have occurred on the, that particular night they were murdered. And one tip sounds promising. A frantic, disheveled woman barged into a restaurant only a few miles from the Cawley's house on the night of the murder. The manager described her as in her early 20s, uh, very nervous, kept looking over her shoulder like she was waiting for someone or was trying to get away from someone. He felt that this was extremely odd and decided to call us. Talking with the manager, and uh, he elaborated even more and actually had a little videotape. Police get to work identifying this woman. We were able to locate the uh, mystery woman in the video. Uh, because they had some uh, still photos that they had from their security system at the restaurant. Uh, once we put that out to the news media, uh, we had some calls that came in and said who they believed this woman was, and then we were able to uh, track her down through her name and ID. Her name is Lindsay Clark. Once we had the woman's name, we were able to check records, uh, check uh, jail records, check uh, all types of different uh, lead systems that we had available. Police talked to Clark, but she has an explanation about what happened that night. She had some situation going on, apparently with a boyfriend, and uh, we were able to rule her out as being involved in a homicide. It's another dead end. And after more than a month-long investigation, police are still without a suspect. The Grove City area was very upset about it and very concerned that, uh, is this person going to strike again, or are these people going to strike again? So uh, the, uh, there was somewhat of a heightened tension in that community. We were probably getting pretty discouraged at this time because we were following up. Everything that came in and everything that came in produced absolutely nothing. For almost three years, that's exactly what police had. Absolutely nothing. No suspects, no leads, 
Nothing that can help them solve this brutal double murder. And for the Cauley family, this horrible crime is all they can think about. As time passed, uh, the daughters of Charles and Lois did call in and inquired about the case uh, frequently. That's pretty typical when you have a uh, family member who's had someone murder. They call in and they want to know the progress of the case. Uh, we got three detectives will be out there. Melissa and Patty Cauley are increasingly concerned oh, okay. that this tragic double murder will never be solved. But one of the Cauley's children doesn't seem very curious about his own parents' murder. I noticed that uh, for some reason, Robert uh, did not have much interest in this case at all. The question is, why? There was some activity from Robert Cauley that seemed to be a little odd. Robert Cauley is the son who discovered his slain parents and called 911. Robert's behavior had changed drastically. He didn't want to talk about his parents ever. Anytime they would try to have a conversation with him, he avoided the conversations. And Collie has blown all the money he inherited when his parents died. Their personal stuff, cars and everything, uh, he went through the money very, very fast. I think he's our best suspect. Robert Collie's odd behavior is not incriminating, but it's enough for police to take a closer look at it. First, they re-examine his alibi. At the time when we talked to Robert Collie, his wife stated that he was at a hockey game. He also said he was at a hockey game. He also produced the tickets for the hockey game that he made sure he had available, which was kind of different. Detective Scott has a hunch. Collie's alibi seems rehearsed. We kept looking at it. Uh, we started to feel more like Robert may be involved more than we thought. Was Collie's wife simply covering for him? He probably did come home at some point after the hockey game but she gave us the specific times. But this whole crime scene would have taken more than a half hour. So it's very possible that she could have been home asleep in bed, but just felt the need to help him out with the alibi. As the investigation continued and we looked at the case more and more and with the fact that his behavior change and the information we're getting from the sisters, we believe that probably his wife was either lying or was not remembering correctly. I mean, this is pointing to basically one person. To find out if someone's lying and see if Robert Colley's story has changed over the years, Detective Scott wants to question Colley once again. But he can't. Robert Colley is nowhere to be found. Finding Robert Colley, uh, we believed, was the key to solving this case. Police have now zeroed in on Robert Colley. Collie found his mother and father brutally stabbed to death. One of the most frustrating things about the case is I believe that the Collies knew the murderer. And unfortunately, I could not find anyone that kind of fit the description that I was looking for. Until now. Everything was pointing to Robert Collie as being our probable suspect. Uh, the crime scene, uh, the way the murders occurred, his behavior. We were pretty confident that Robert was our best suspect at that time, and we needed to interview him again. But after his parents were murdered, Collie left Ohio and hasn't stopped moving since. We found out that he had moved uh, to Phoenix. Uh, he had moved to a couple other locations. We were able to track down Robert Collie in Houston, Texas, finally. I appreciate you coming down here. Robert Collie has been living in Texas with his wife and children. He's been working as an aeronautical engineer. We asked for Robert to come and review all the evidence with us, that we felt we had a new direction on the case, and we'd love to have his input on this new direction. So we got some new information, and I want to share it with you. OK. And I appreciate you coming down here and taking the time. To... With no physical evidence linking Colley to the murders, the whole case rides on this one interview. If Robert Colley was the killer of Charles and Lois, we knew that this interview was the key to the whole investigation. We knew if he is the one who did it, uh, that if we didn't get this confession, this case would probably go completely unsolved. At first, investigators treat Robert Cauley with kid gloves. On his face, there was some apprehension because he didn't know what was going on. And you know, we reassured him that we were here to uh, try to solve the murders of his family. Because we have some new evidence that I want you to look at. And we get your thoughts about it. Now, see how you're feeling about it. 
Detective Scott lays out the facts for Robert Colley. For some reason, as we look at this back door, it looks like there's a little bit more glass probably on the outside than there is on the inside. We basically put everything on the table about the evidence, about it not being a robber, that they knew their killers. But Robert, let me tell you something. This has got to be some of the dumbest burglars I've ever seen in my life that would take this. It's staged. Isn't that crazy? It's staged. He started feeling pressure. I could see it on him. Uh, we could actually see his heart racing in his shirt. Uh, we made note of that. Uh, he, at that point, was realizing uh, that uh, he's a suspect. Investigators question Robert Cauley for hours, slowly applying more and more pressure as they go. Unfortunately, a lot of this puzzle is starting to come to light, Robert. A lot of it's starting to point in one direction. Detective Scott lets Robert Cauley know that the evidence points right at Cauley. For the first few hours, stick with the story that he had no knowledge of what I was talking about. Uh, he had, uh, would never kill his mom and dad. Uh, and the whole thing was just preposterous. But as we continued the interview, you could see that the interview was starting to take its toll on Robert. Uh, physically, we could see that uh, he was actually starting to sweat a little bit. I think Robert felt uh, that he was caught. I was 100% sure at that point Robert did this. And finally, Robert Cauley breaks. Robert basically said that he went over to the house to discuss the business with his father and that it turned into an argument and that his father attacked him and they had to defend himself. He pushed me, I fell down on the table and he got mad about that. He wouldn't hear that, you know, he was the one that was pushing me. I tried to walk away, he wouldn't let me. The next thing I know, somebody's screaming at me, telling me that I'm a failure and that I'm no good. What do you say, you know? Things get out of hand. I think I was sad when my dad did My mom tried to stop me. I think I accidentally stabbed her. I got so scared, I just continued to do that. And then I tried to talk to them, tell them I love them. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. After Robert confessed to us about the murders, uh, we made a decision to go ahead and arrest him. Robert Cauley is charged with the murder of his parents. We felt elated. We felt fantastic. Uh, we were very excited about closing out this case. Collie's trial is the talk of Grove City, Ohio. Everyone has an opinion. This case not only divided a community, it divided the Collie family. The two sisters, Patty and Melissa, sat on opposite sides of the courtroom. One thought he was guilty. The other thought he was innocent. And at the center of the trial is Collie's confession. It became clear during the Colley trial that the state had very little forensic evidence. Robert Colley was convicted on his own words. One motive for this killing was uh, the stormy relationship between the father and son. That the father wanted Robert to run the family business. Robert did not want to leave his career and do that. After a month-long trial and a three-day jury deliberation, Robert Colley is found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life. For the residents of Grove City, it's the end to a dark chapter. No one wanted to believe that Robert Colley was capable of killing his two parents. This particular case is a uh, very tragic case to have their own family member, their son, come in and kill them in their golden years where they were looking to retire, enjoy life because they'd worked so hard, was a horrible tragedy.